Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'll start momentarily. Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of TechSite's webinar series, Pioneers of Digital Pathology. We are delighted to have a couple of pathology experts in Dr. Couturier and Blaine Matheson today. Dr. Couturier is medical director at ARUP Laboratories and he and Blaine work closely together and we are excited to learn from them today around AI and machine learning with regard to clinical parasitology. We'll turn the time to them in just a moment. Today, we plan to cover briefly who TechSite is, and then we'll turn the time to Dr. Mark and Blaine for reviewing microscopic diagnostic methods today for stool parasites, the development and validation of an AI model, real life applications in a diagnostic parasitology laboratory, future developments, and for sure, we'll leave time for Q&A. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments into the chat at any time. Those are being monitored and we will do our best to respond accordingly uh, at the end of the presentation. I'm Jacob Hicks and I lead our sales efforts here at TechSite. Just a bit about TechSite. We've been around about a decade. Uh, TechSite was founded as a technology transfer out of ARUP laboratories in the University of Utah. And we have built a software AI and workflow platform that enables laboratories in the human medical space, veterinary and environmental to increase efficiencies and accuracies and to help them be more productive as they are fighting the constant challenge of a labor skill shortage for microscopy skilled roles. We have been growing big and fast and we've built a platform that everything from sample prep to analysis to reporting and all in a scalable, secure environment that's HIPAA compliant and recognizing that if our AI and workflow platform does not integrate into a lab's workflow, it really won't drive the value. Uh, we made some recent announcements this week as well that TechSite's platform is not only for clinical pathology, but also even moving into the AP space, a collaboration with Mayo Clinic. Our mission is to be the world's leading digital diagnostics platform. And ARUP and Mark and Blaine today uh, certainly have done some amazing things as we've collaborated with them in the parasitology space. Without further ado, I'll turn the time to Dr. Mark Couturier and Blaine Matheson. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Um, how do you fit six years into 25 minutes? Um, we're going to try to do that right now. So Blaine and I have listed our relevant disclosures. Really, the most important are TechSite and Apicor, uh collaborators on our uh, parasitology work. Uh, Jacob already kind of went through the learning objectives. So just briefly, we'll review microscopy for parasitology. We'll talk about developing a model for uh, AI to use in parasitology for stool. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the implementation tricks and challenges uh, to get this into the lab. So I'll start with reviewing the microscopic methods for parasitology. And so if we think of parasitology, the morphologic analysis is what's been done for over 150 years under rudimentary microscopes up to modern microscopes. In the last 30 to 40 years, antigen detection augmented some of that testing. In the last 10 years, molecular testing is starting to start to creep into some of the test volumes. But a lot of the volume still teetered on the need for microscopy. And artificial intelligence and machine learning really became an integrated augmentation um, in the work that we did for the morphologic analysis on a microscope. So what are the different microscopy applications in parasitology? They're, they're, I mean, they're very broad. Um, you can do wet mounts, either direct or concentrated, trichrome smears, um, and those two are the components of standard O and P. Coccidian smears, either the modified acid fast or the saffron and stains. 
Uh, you can get histopathological tissue specimens with parasites in them. And you can even do sectioning of macroscopic worms to get definitive identifications. So we use microscopes a lot for uh, GI infections from parasites. And it's, it's not trivial. Um, while the method's been around for decades to over a century, um, the process is very manual. So in our lab, we've, we've semi-automated a lot of the processing, but uh, a lot of laboratories still do the sample to concentration to slide prep entirely manual. Um, so even with our semi-automation, there's still a lot of workflow, a lot of personnel that goes into it. Once we have a concentrated uh, stool specimen, then we have to make two preparations. The wet mount, which you see at the top, and the trichrome permanent smear stain, which you see at the bottom. And both of those get interrogated on a microscope. And what is the technologist doing when they're reading these? Well, essentially, in our previous workflow, uh, a run of ONPs was 30 trichromes and 30 wet mounts per technologist. This could take, you know, variably between two and a half to three hours. And historically, it would be about 98% negativity rate. And any positives that were putatively identified by the primary reader would then put them in a review queue for a second person to back read. And so what is the technologist actually doing when they're doing all this work? They're basically just scanning across the slides. It's, it's a random run um, back and forth across the slides to create a requisite field of view reviewed to feel confident either calling something positive or negative. Depending on the technologist, this time can take really anywhere between two to five minutes. Um, and it also depends on the specimen. So we talk about questionable negatives. Those are specimens that don't contain parasites, but they contain distractors and artifacts and you know, stain inconsistencies that just make you question whether that specimen is truly negative or maybe you're missing some weird positive. Those slides can take over 10 minutes. So that's a, a very brief snapshot of what we do in classical parasitology. So we wanted to try to develop uh, with TechSide basically a, a model and uh, apply it to stool. And that, that's not the easiest thing as we've learned. And so digital imaging of these slides, basically the concept would be scanning the entire slide. That's, that's the concept as I'll get to later. We didn't quite go with that. And threading each individual field of view into a virtual slide, kind of like Google Earth does. And then a machine learning model or a human could look at those virtual scans. If we're going to be doing digital imaging, the scan quality has to be very high resolution. It's going to be easy for technologists to use um, because if it's not easy, they're not going to use it. And it's going to be as good or better than when you see on a microscope because we can't step backward in quality. And it's going to be time efficient. In other words, if I have a scanner that takes an hour to scan one stool specimen, it's not going to be effective when I have over 150,000 specimens eager to get through. So going into development, I think there's some important things to clarify. I think some people, when they think about AI and uh, machine learning, think, oh, it's, it's this sentient being that takes over human roles and takes over. That's, that's Hollywood drama. It's gonna be what you make it. We were from the outset looking to try to develop a model that would function as a screening tool and not a definitive identification tool. So in other words, we scan something, the model looks at it, it flags stuff. Maybe it's right and maybe it's wrong in what it called it, but it's still an organism. And that was okay because we have experts who can look at the images and then look at the slide to determine what it is. So this is a finder tool, so to speak, is what we're going for. And then the software is not determining a slide to be negative either. 
it's been tuned to always show images of something because it's so sensitive at the expense of uh, specificity, which we'll go over later. And so with that con concept in mind, the goal was basically, could we just knock out 70-80% of the negatives where you just have to look at the candidate garbage images on a electronic interface and not have to actually scan all the slide to call it negative. And then in the meantime, still do our wet mounts as normal until we could develop a model for that down the line. So again, it's a complement, it's an augmentation to a technologist. It's not performing a result and it's not a replacement. So what's the concept of training a convolutional neural network, which is the type of image analysis model that we used? Um, I could have used parasite examples, but knowing this is a broad audience, I'm just gonna go with something everyone can recognize. So we're going with dogs. So there's a dog is a parasite, if we wanna use the analogy. There's lots of different types of parasites, lots of different types of dogs, and they all have subtle differences. When we do a CNN, a CNN will extract different features that it recognizes as unique to that organism, or in this case, dog. And it will find the essence of that based on stuff like pixel densities or uh, textures. Now, we don't appreciate those, but the analogy would be the coat difference, the snouts, the ears, the eyes. But the AI is seeing it at a level that human brain doesn't really conceptualize. And then we classify these organisms, call them classes. And so that would be our pug, our husky. Um, and then we basically feed in lots of more data on those different classes. And we refine the model. We look at the data output through graphs. We look at performance. And then once we find a model that's performing to our expectation, to what we want the model to be able to do, then essentially we lock it down and start trying to train on it and validate. So we might get to the point where Husky knows all the variations of Husky, but it doesn't mean it won't eventually false call a wolf because a wolf looks kind of like Husky. And that wolf may be a different class. And then you can go back and put that in and retrain your model to now know the difference between a wolf and a Husky. So I talked a little bit about the performance that we wanted to get. So perfect specificity versus lower sensitivity. What would that give us? Well, that would identify everything that's true, but it's gonna miss some positives. And we don't really want that. We wanna detect every possible positive and have some false calls instead. So if we think of that yellow line there as being our triangulation, there we would identify every positive. And we're going to see some junk on the negatives, but a human can decide whether it's worth pursuing or not. But really what we want to do is find a sweet spot where this darker yellow line is right at the edge of all positives still detected, but we're minimizing the false positives. So we're the less wasted time to have to look at specimens that aren't significant. And none of this is possible if you don't have good data in and good images to evaluate. So here's just an example of some organisms with two different scanners. Scanner A gave really poor resolution, dark, um, difficult to discern features, and scanner B gave really high definition, really easy to discern features. So not every scanner is created equal. And then from a workflow standpoint, you know, the question is, do we really need to scan a whole slide? Because a human doesn't do that in uh, stool specimens. And so if we scan the whole slide, it would take 25 to 30 minutes, which is not feasible. So we came up with a theoretical slide scan area, which was akin to what a human actually scans. And that actually takes four to five minutes. And then we wanted to see whether using that con constrained area, what would our limit of detection look like compared to a human? And so on the left column here, you'll see when we take a specimen that we know has GRD and blastocystis, two parasites, and dilute it in a series of negative stool, the human starts to miss it at a one to eight dilution. And by one to 32, they are missing it every time. That same scan area and specimens 
You see the AI software on the right? Failed to detect it. Never through the dilution series. It detected it every time. So we knew that the model is actually performing better than a human. We did the same thing for modified acid fasting. So that was trichrome stain I just showed you. Um, so this is a different project, same trend. Human did not detect anything below a one to eight dilution, whereas the AI model detected down to 256 and 512. Um, and this has also been integrated in our lab. So we use this as well as trichrome. And with that, I'm gonna pass the stage over to Blaine, who's gonna talk about the practical implications. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Couturier. And so we we already covered a little bit on the uh, kind of a refresher on the diagnostics of um, intestinal parasites. And then uh, Dr. C kind of gave you an overview on the um, very broad overview on the development of of the uh, model and um, scan areas and sensitivity specificity. And so now I'm going to talk about uh, kind of like real life applications. For example, if, if you're in a clinical laboratory and you wanted to bring this technology on board, what are some of the things you might want to consider, some of the challenges you might have to overcome, and some of the um, changes to your workflow that, that you might want to consider? So first of all, let's go back to the OVID parasite workflow. Well, you might need some potential changes to your oven parasite processing. For example, slide preparation. A lot of labs like to do what's called hills and valleys, where you do alternating levels of the stool where it goes kind of thick to thin, thick to thin. Um, scanners don't like that. Scanners really like nice, flat, homogenous slides. So if you're in a lab that does kind of the hills and valleys approach, your technicians or whoever processes, and sorry, whoever um whoever prepares your slides might have to uh, adopt a, a different technique for making the smears more compatible for a scanner. Also, slides need to be cover slipped before they can be scanned. And conventional cover slipping methods, such as a per mount or a mounting medium with a glass cover slip, can take several days to dry adequately for scanner use. You don't want to put a, you don't want to put a, um, a slide with mounting media in a scanner that hasn't dried thoroughly because it might start to leak and, and gum up your scanner. And we actually learned that the hard way in early development. So you might want to invest in an automated cover slipper, for example, those that are used in histo uh, histology laboratories. And depending on the amount of labor required uh, for preparation versus reading, um, and this will play a role more in the wet mount, which we're still developing, uh, you might uh, might involve possible reorganizing of your workforce. For example, if you have a technologist heavy lab, you may, may shift to more technician heavy um, for preparation purposes. Also develop and maintaining QC for the scans. And this is not the same as the QC for the stain. So if you do a trichrome stain in your lab, you probably do a daily QC for that stain, but you also need to QC the scan. So what we do is we have a positive with a known organism and a negative, and those are scanned every day. And whoever's assigned to a specific bench reads those scans and they look to make sure it detected the organism and the frequency. For example, say for the trichrome, the, the Giardia it should find between 200 and 600 every day. And maybe one day it finds 400, one day 450. So there's a certain range that it has to find. We actually kind of discovered something interesting. Our uh, modified acid fast QC all of a sudden started finding more and more and more oocysts of cryptosporidium. And we started to worry that maybe something happened to the model. But as it turns out, the um, every time you expose the QC slide to the scanner, that light starts to bleach the slide a little bit. And the, the light was bleaching the background um, of the fecal material. So the fecal material was getting paler and more oocysts were being visible to the scanner. So it started finding more. So you might want to put a, um, or you're probably going to have to put a, an expiration date on your, the slides you use for QC. Um, what do you do for a failed or incomplete scans? For example, if there's not a lot of fecal material or if it's a really watery stool specimen, it may not scan or it may scan partially. And so then you need to decide how do you handle that. And in our lab, we just manually read them. Uh, you need to have a backup plan with there are any problems or any in the process, like the cover slippers are broken, your scanner goes down, uh, there's internet issues, so you might have trouble uploading the scans to the cloud. Um, so you need to have a backup plan for all of that. 
luckily you're still produce you're still prepping your specimens per the classic oven parasite method. So worst case scenario, you might have to go back to manually reading for a while. And another thing is how well will employees embrace such a change? Uh, older versus younger workforce. Maybe someone who's been doing parasitology for 30 years is going to be a little less savvy for adopting this technology than, say, uh, uh, a technologist who's just coming out of college. Um, so typical lab workflow, like if I was going to sit down at the bench right now and do an ONP run, I would typically read the wet mount first, and then I look at the images. And I would manually back read either the trichrome or the modified acid fast under certain scenarios. For example, any suspect organisms are seen in the images. If there's any discrepancy between the wet mount and the images, maybe I see, I think I see the cysts of Giardia in the wet mount, but nothing's found in the images. I'm probably going to manually read that trichrome just to be safe. And then failed, invalid, or incomplete scans. There's a sub bullet there about the medical director review, and I, I'm going to save that for a couple slides down the road where I'm going to give you an example. So just to kind of refresh what Dr. C mentioned earlier, the goal was to successfully detect common intestinal protozoa and screen out a minimum of 70 to 80 percent of negatives. And having actually done this myself in the clinical lab, I would probably say it's at least 90 to 95 percent. We've got runs of pure negatives where not a single slide has to be back read. So I'm going to give you, I'm just going to kind of go through a, kind of like the process, like when a technologist brings up the software and looks at it. These are snapshots from earlier in the process. So the GUI doesn't look quite like this, uh, but you'll get a general idea. So um, the a technologist will log in. The, the first scans at the top should be the daily QCs if they haven't been evaluated. Then there's a series of runs, and the technologists can sign a run to themselves, so it won't be visible to other technologists unless they would actually go in and manually look for the specific accession. So you can assign something specifically to you. And then you just start going through the specimens one at a time. And, and here's one I brought up. And I actually screen captured this before it was actually read in the lab. And once I, after I kind of go through the process, I'll tell you what it was read as compared to what I saw just in the image analysis. So you can see, remember as Dr. C said earlier, it, it's, it's sensitivity over specificity. So you can see it's going to flag a, a couple things in almost every category. But if the technologist continues to go through, they start to see, okay, now look, it called 83 dientamoeba and 88 in the endolimex iodamoeba category. Now, these two categories are combined now just because of the morphologic similarities of them. But it definitely seems there's objects here that fall into that category. And as a technologist, when I look at these, these look very much like iodamoeba or endolimex trophs to me. So I can click on an example and highlight it, and it'll bring it up a slightly larger plane. I can click on this exemplars button, and that'll show me images of these organisms in different fixatives and different stains to kind of show the morphologic variation um, that one might see to try to see if it matches anything. And then once I'm convinced, I check the organism, and I set the slide, set the slide aside, and then I manually read it for confirmation. So I did all this with these images prior to it actually being read in the diagnostic lab, but I went back and looked at this accession later, and it was indeed reported out as iodamoeba bushlii. Um, this is an example of kind of a clean negative. This just goes to show you that because we put sensitivity over specificity, it's always going to flag something. But a technologist can easily look at these images. I made them small just so you can appreciate how many it flags. But a technologist can go through these images within a couple minutes and say the slide's negative and sp instead of spending two to three minutes analyzing it manually. Uh, we also created prevalence regions, and prevalence regions simulate a 100x with oil objective or a 1,000x total objective. And the purpose of the prevalence regions are twofold. One, you could use it for enumerating things like red cells and white cells, so you don't have to manually pull the slide. And the other is you could it helps to see if your scan is complete. If um, there's 14 prevalence regions and four or five of them are blank, it probably means they didn't scan in those areas. So you have an incomplete scan. So it's a good way to evaluate overall um, scan quality of that specimen. Um, and just to show you some images, just for more of a show and tell, here's what cryptosporidium looks like in the MAF model. You can highlight it. In this particular one, you can actually even see the individual sporozoites in the oocyst. Um, here's what cyclospore stain looks like. As those of you who identify cyclospore, you know it often doesn't like to stain. So we also um, 
We also train on the ghost forms. The end user only sees cyclospore. They don't see uh, um, stain versus ghost. It's all kind of rolled into one class. Uh, here's the lab workflow. I've, I've kind of gone over this earlier in a slide, so I'm not going to beat it too much. I'm not going to go re repeat it too much, but I do. Let me, let's follow this pathway here to the left where suspect organism seen, technologist review slide, organisms um, flagged by the software, confirmed by manual read or further identified. Let's go to the right here where it says no. This is when the, the technologist, where, the, where there's, the technologist sees things in the images that they're pretty sure are parasites, but they're having a hard time actually finding it on the manual read. So in this case, they can go to medical director review. The medical director can look at the images and say, yeah, that's classic for this organism. Go ahead and report it, even though you couldn't find it on the trichrome slide. And here's an example where that happened. If you can look, see here, this one example under Giardia Troph, there's this one example and I enlarged it so you can see. Any microbiologist trained in parasitology can look at that and be like, this is a pretty classic Giardia Troph. But they spent about 20 minutes and couldn't find the darn thing on the slide. So this went to medical director review and Dr. Couture was able to look at it and say, yeah, that's Giardia, go ahead and report it out accordingly. Um, and this also goes back to our LOD studies where that helped demonstrate that the uh, that the that the scan profile and the model are, are probably more sensitive than your average technologist. And uh, for this last section, um, I'm going to briefly go over future developments. This is the development of the wet mount model, and we're currently working on this right now. But I do want to go over it just as kind of a fun show and tell to kind of let you guys know what's down the pipeline for us. So with wet mounts, there's a lot more challenges than you have on a permanent smear. One of them is the acquisition of rare classes. Just because you don't see schistosoma in your lab, but once every five years, doesn't mean a patient isn't going to come into your lab with a schistosome infection. So we have to be able to train on things like the schistosomes and the hookworms and the capillaries and all these kind of rare and esoteric worms that are likely to be seen in a patient, even though you may not see it, but once or once every five to 10 years in your career. Um, we had to, because of the, the drying of a wet mount, of a, you know, a wet, wet mount with a cover slip, we had to develop a mounting medium to help slow the drying process. So you could produce multiple slides and send them through a scanner without, without drying too fast. You need a scanner where the slides are loaded flat. And if there's mechanics on the scanner, you know, it needs to be able to move it so the cover slip doesn't shift around too much. Uh, development of a scan area. In your typical oven parasite workflow, the entire 22 by 22 cover slip is read in is entirely at uh, 10x and often entirely at 40x as well. So how do we develop a scan area that's going to catch the large worm eggs in the small protozoan cysts but still maintain um, a good scan time? And the last and another one is finding the optimal levels of scan. As we learned in during our development, the little protozoan cysts and the large helminth eggs and larvae don't necessarily settle in the same plane. Some settle up here, some settle down here. So it might actually require scanning the slide multiple times. And then, of course, after clinical validation, designing a workflow um, to incorporate um, AI screening into the entire ONP process. And that's our goal, is to eventually have it where everything is at least screened by AI and only suspect positives are read. Here's a cool little slide that Dr. C put together. This is kind of a, a wet mountain side view and you can, it kind of demonstrates how different things will settle at different levels. And so if you scan up here, you're gonna catch the worm eggs. But if you scan down here, you're gonna get the protozoan troves, but you might miss the worm eggs. Um, and lastly, I know we're really close on time. I'm just gonna go through some fun um, photos to show you what some of these organisms look like in a wet mount. So these are trophozoites of chylomastix. This photo was actually not taken by the scanner. This was um, for the uh, mounting media uh, study I did to help to develop a mounting media that doesn't dry too fast. So these photos were taken about two hours after the slide was prepped and lets to sit at room temperature. Uh, same thing with this Giardia trophin cyst, this Strongyloides larva, and this Trachyrus egg. And there might be one more. Yeah, and this Balantioides larva. So these were all taken on slides that sat for about 90 minutes to two hours at room temp. So this was part of our mounting medium drying study. 
And then these next few images just kind of show you what these organisms look like in the gooey. So these are paragonimus eggs and strongyloides larvae. Because strongyloides are large and can coil up, we only trained on the anterior part of the worm. So we only really train the software to recognize from the buccal entrance to the, to the esophagus. So most of the time, the software is going to flag it on the anterior end. Um, here's hookworm eggs and the eggs of uh, Clonorchus and or Opisthorchus. Again, most people don't see this in their career, but you never know when a patient might come in your lab presenting with this disease. So the software has to be able to find it. Here's pinworm eggs, pin, you know, wet, you know, you don't order an ovum parasite exam if you suspect pinworm, but they are shed in stool and might be detected. Uh, here's a bunch of ascaris eggs. We trained ascaris on all four morphotypes, fertile and infertile, decorticated and mammalated. So um, the software should be able to pick it up no matter what's presented in the stool. Here's some more uh, Balantioides coli trophs. Uh, Cystoisospora belly, um, we're, uh, we use the UV screen for that, but we also train the wet mount software for it. And then there's some Schistosoma mansoni eggs as well that we got from collaborators from Africa. So in closing, artificial intelligence such as machine learning can help improve the workflow in a diagnostic lab by one of several methods. One is improving turnaround time. That's you know essentially reducing the time needed to manually read specimens, screening out at least 80% of your negative specimens. We didn't touch on this much because of time, but it less microscopy also means reduced ergonomic injuries that might be associated with prolonged mic uh, microscopy. Improves employee satisfaction. You know, your employees, instead of spending hours looking at negative stool, whenever they actually have to pull a manual slide, they're actually scrutinizing and identifying something that's putative positive for a parasite. It might be more engaging for an increasingly younger workforce, and um, it could allow for image uh, uh, analysis remotely. So as we work from home more often these days since the COVID pandemic, maybe you could have people who actually help perform this task while working remotely from home. So uh, there's a lot of ways that AI um, and digital, uh, digital imaging and machine learning can help improve the parasitology workflow in the clinical laboratory. And um, here's our acknowledgement slides. I mean, this is, this is a project like this couldn't have come together without a lot of hard work from uh, multifacets of different people. So uh, there's been a lot of people that have really helped and are still helping now to, to make this, uh, this dream a reality. So uh, thanks again to everyone who's been part of this. And with that, I will turn it over to Jacob, I believe. Thank you so much, Blaine and Dr. Couturier. We do have a few questions that have rolled in. And Daisy asked if there's reference material that can be used or is available for some of these rare organisms to aid in training. Um, I'll briefly respond and then um, Dr. C or Blaine, if you have anything to add. Within the tool itself, the TechSite platform, there is an exemplar resource. So organisms that are more commonly seen and the more rare ones, any images that have been in the data set can be viewed to help assist with training. We also have a clinical education portion of our platform where users can even add their own additional scans or images to add to the library. Uh, Mark or Blaine? Um, for me, yeah, from an image standpoint for, for training, if you're talking about training, Staff I think maybe versus even training a model. I think that that's where I'm not sure where the question is. Training I, I a model. suspect I suspect they're asking how do you get specimens if you want to validate this in your lab. Okay, so that's right? an even different question. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. how I interpret it, but I could be wrong. Okay. Um, well, I guess depending on which the question is. So I, let's let's hit on all three real quick. Training the model. If you go with the tech site product, it's already trained. You don't have to do anything. Um, you have to verify the performance in your own lab. Verification, that will get tricky. Where do you obtain the organisms? Some are available from uh, commercial sources, um, and some are not. Some we really have to scrounge collaborators in Africa, Asia, um, veterinary sources in the United States who are awesome to, to help us out to get some of these. So, so that is a, that's going to be the challenge, especially for 
the wet mount model. Thank you. Alexander asked, what mounting media do you recommend for wet mount? For, to work with this, the development we're doing, again, we are not done this development. So we developed a specific media that's at this point proprietary till we publish it. Um, so once we publish it, it will be public domain. Anyone can use it. But at this point, it's our it's our research data, so we're not divulging the exact makeup of it. But it will be as soon as we can finish the work and fast track publication. It'll be all the details will be out there for anybody to to uh, mirror the the prep process. Thank you. And then Eric asked, "What scanner do you recommend?" So I'll I'll answer high level. The TechSite platform has intentionally been built to try to be compatible with various scanners depending on the sample type. You heard not all scanners are created equal. I think it's how Dr. C said it. And depending on the sample type, from parasitology to bacteriology to pap smear to hematology to tissue, whatever, uh, TechSite would give some guidance and steer. And then depending on your volume needs as well. So small capacity, medium capacity, large volume. Uh, Dr. Mark and Blaine, you two have been exposed to quite a few. What would you add? What scanner do you recommend? I mean, I think that's a good point. It's it's what are your what are your models um, for your lab like throughput? Like how do you do your lab? Do you do onesie twosie as they come in? Do you batch runs because you have high volumes? Those are considerations you're going to have when choosing a scanner. Um, we we really preferred a scanner that gave really high resolution images. Um, for us, that's just because of our volumes are so high. Some of the scanners with low resolution images, they still, at the digital level, they still identified the organism enough that the model could detect it. But when you try to review it in the interface, it was it was almost guesswork. So if you have really low volumes, that might be fine because your positivity is probably also low. But for our volumes and our positivity rate, that was going to be an impediment. So we chose a higher resolution scanner with what's, what's called a uh, depth of focus uh, best find essentially is it that's not really what it's called but it's think about it like focusing and capturing pictures at multiple levels and then saying that's the best one and it shows you that and it makes a composite for our needs that was really the best option but that may not be the solution every lab, lab needs yeah and also you know we've been sent with this from the beginning so scanners have changed and stuff over time mm -hmm. and maybe the one we're using for trichrome isn't appropriate for wet mount so it's uh what we do may be different than what someone who gets a commercial product from tech site is going to get so um because we played with a lot of different scanners over the the last what four or five years now six years six years <laughs> That's right. And the tech side team is happy to consult uh, with those depending on the application and the volume requirements. We do have a couple other questions, and I think they're ones we will follow up uh, independently, uh, some ones related to LIS and results and where they're stored. Um, yeah, so we'll, so we'll do that offline with those of you who raised those questions. Really appreciate it. We just want to be sensitive to time. Dr. Couturier, Blaine, Thank you so much for your energy and enthusiasm and your, your wisdom here today. We've learned a lot and are delighted to continue to collaborate with ARUP Laboratories. Once again, thank you to all of you attending and we hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you.